Good afternoon. So last time we discussed binary search trees, and today the plan is to <clears throat> look over how you would print out all of the elements in a binary search tree. And then we're going to move on to discussing a different type of way to store a collection of objects, which is called a heap, which has a very similar uh, tree structure, but which stores the elements in a, uh, a different fashion depending on its value. First, let's just recall that a binary search tree allows us to store data in a tree structure, but in a very organized tree structure. In other words, it has this left to right property, which is actually quite desirable when trying to search or find a particular element. So for example, if we're searching for a number like 12, just by looking at the root node, which is an 8, we know that we can discard or not look at all of the nodes to the left of that node. And when the tree is balanced, in other words, there's approximately as many nodes on the left as on the right in all of the little subtrees, what that means is that in the process of searching for a particular element, we essentially eliminate half of the possible values at each step. So I sort of alluded to this, well I didn't allude to it, we mentioned this, uh, we went over this, which is, remember, if we're searching a list, if we don't know how the values are structured, it's at, at best, you know, the big O of N algorithm. You have to search, on average, you have to search at least around half of them, and uh, at worst, it's all of them. But if you searched a sorted list, then what you did was you cut that number significantly down to big O of log N. That's what the binary search tree is attempting to do. It's attempting to say, all right, well, if you're always going to want this collection of objects to be in a sorted uh, fashion, if you're gonna, always going to want to search a lot for these objects, we should probably store them inherently in a sorted fashion. And that's what we have uh, with a binary search tree. Okay? So the added structure gives us very fast searching. So let's see, last time we went over how to insert and erase an element in a binary search tree. Ah, okay, so um, I spent all this time talking about the ins and outs of inserting elements, erasing elements, but we didn't actually search for an element or show how might one actually search for an element, which is why it's, this is why it's called a binary search tree, okay? So if we wanted to find the seven, or if there, it, maybe we don't even know if there is a seven in the list. So we're trying to search for the value seven. The procedure is the following. First, seven is less than eight. Go left. In other words, forget about every single set of elements on the right. Now, seven is larger than four. Go right. In other words, forget about everything to the left of four. Seven and bigger than six, go to the right. Seven equals seven, done. So even though there's about 10 nodes in our tree, we've only had to do about four comparisons. Okay? So that's, uh, well, this is a very small example, but it took us basically three moves, or four comparisons. Okay? Uh, now, like I said last time, at the end there was, a, there was a question raised, and their final example was, if you're not careful with a binary search tree, the order in which you insert the elements could completely diminish the utility of storing elements in a binary search tree. Okay, and here's the canonical example, which is, all right, uh, you, insert, you insert elements in order, in a sorted order. Then you get something like this, one, two, three, four, five, six, in that order. Then if you want to search for a particular element, it is equivalent to searching through a sorted list. You literally have to go through each one, one at a time. You can't skip over anything, even though you know that there's a, an order to it, you can't access any of those nodes inside. Okay, so just recall the definition of balanced, because this is going to be uh, um, part of why we're learning about this heap data structure as well. This notion of balanced is, again, binary search tree has the really nice property of searching is really fast. It's big O of log of n because we're searching a sorted collection of objects. Now, 
It, at worst, though, it's like big O of n because the search tree structure may not be uh, balanced. So it would be really nice if we could construct, say, a tree that it remains balanced every, after each time we insert or erase an element. So here we go. Here's some execution times uh, based on containers. Okay, so let's think about this one line at a time. Just look at that first line. Add or remove an element at the end. Remember, this is what vectors are known for. Okay, you have a stack, and you can add elements on top, or you can take them away. That's easy. Now, the, do you guys know what the plus means? Big O of one plus. This is not standard notation. But what it means is, is that when you create a vector, here's what actually happens. You create a vector, and the compiler doesn't really know when it creates the vector how many elements you intend to store in that vector. It, know it, it knows it has to store them contiguously, but it takes a guess. So for example, you create a vector of ints, and let's say you don't initialize it with like, if you do vector of ints v of say 20, it'll create maybe 20 or maybe about 30 or 40 capacity. Okay? It'll say, oh, okay, let me put a reserve in for say 40 elements. You requested 20, but you could absolutely push back more later on. But then what happens is, is once you get beyond that amount, pushing back next, the next element beyond the capacity, what it, that next location in memory may not be available. And if that location in memory is not available, what does it do? It has to deallocate the entire vector, create a new location in memory, put everything back in, and then push back that new element. Okay? So most of the time, you just put in new elements, for erase, you absolutely just pop them off. That's always big O of 1. Okay? But when you're adding an element, as long as you've got the reserve, it's just big O of 1. It's right there. It's easy. But as soon as you break out of that reserve location in memory, there's that time when you have to actually deallocate everything, reallocate a new larger location in memory, copy everything back in, and then continue pushing back elements. Okay? You don't have any control over that, and that's actually a good thing. That's why it's big O1 plus. Now, with a linked list, do you have this issue at all? Do you have the plus issue at all with a linked list? No, because it's not stored contiguous. So you can put that location in memory anywhere you want. Okay? New element comes in, you just put it wherever you want. Okay? Now, add remove element in the middle. Now, for a vector, you could potentially have to you know, take out all of the elements above, put in the new element, and then put them all back in. Or in other words, you might have to modify all of the elements that, well, you do have to modify all of the elements that come after that element in that list of values. So that involves, um, you know, somewhere in the middle, potentially messing with or modifying all n elements. But remember, with a linked list, the reason why linked lists are ideal is because if you want to insert an element in the middle, well, you just modify locally those links inside, you put in the new link, and you're good to go. Um, OK, now with a binary tree, adding and removing an element anywhere is big O of log n. Why? Because it takes big O log of n to find a value. Once you've found, say, a 7 in the binary search tree, if it's already in there, you do nothing. But you had to search for it first. Now, if it's not in there, it still took big O of log n to get to the end of that set of branches. And then to insert it at the end is just adding a new link. So that's big O of log n. Okay. Now, if we want to access the kth element, this is why vectors are ideal under most circumstances. If I, have the, if I want to quickly access a record somewhere, I can just jump right to that record because everything is contiguous. If I want the 2,512,000th element, as long as I know where the first record is, I can just jump automatically to that address. With a linked list, I have to iterate through all of the previous k elements because there's no telling where that record is going to be located. There is no kth element 
per se in a binary search tree. You can define a kth element in some sense, but you're not really, there's really, it's not really that because it, you shouldn't think of it like that, okay? Um, you should think of it instead of as finding a value. Okay, so that's, that's the idea. There are big differences between a vector, a linked list, and a binary search tree structure. So I, instead of vector, I should have said like an array. That's an example of an array. Array is where you have contiguous memory, okay? Um, okay, so there are important differences, and how you, what you plan to do with your collection of objects will determine which data structure you use. So how would we print all of the elements? So don't read the, the, the one, two, three, four real quick. Just think about, just focus on this picture here. How would you print out all of the elements in a binary search tree, and let's just say in order, or in any order, but you can't print out an element multiple times, okay? You can only print out an element one at a time, and it must appear once and, exact, and only once. So how would you actually print out all the elements in a binary search tree? With a vector, it's easy, because you just start at the first address and you print them out one by one. Linked list, equally easy, okay? You just start at the first node, print it out, go to the next, print, next, okay? But with a binary search tree, it's not quite so one-dimensional, okay? There's going down, there's going up, there's going left, there's going right. It's a little more of a two-dimensional thinking. So here's the kind of the algorithm or the idea about how you would print out all the elements in a binary search tree. So again, think of it as start at the root node and then pull all the way to the left. And when you cannot go left anymore, that element is actually which element? The absolute smallest element in the, in, in the tree. Yeah. Okay. So you print that one out. Okay. So as long as there's no left child, as long as there is a left child, you keep pulling to the left. When there's no longer a left child, you print out that element. Then you check to see if there's a, you print that node. Hmm. I'm trying to, what if there's a, um, a node, he, a right child? Hang on. Because the two would go here. Huh. I never noticed this before. Let's see. Maybe I'm just not thinking right today. Let's see. Huh, okay, you do need to check to see if there's a right, unless there's no, re, unless there's, there will never be a right child there. But there could be a right child, right? If there's a two here. All the way to the left, print that node. Okay, well, let's just assume. Okay, so there's, it looks like there's a missing step here, which is if there is a right child, repeat. Pull all the way to the left. If there's no right child, then you relax up uh, and you print that node. Yeah, the two would be above the one, wouldn't it? Yeah, so there will, there will never be a right node here. That's why. So, again, either if there, what if there is a right child here, then this doesn't work, but there will never be a right child here. So, hmm? Uh, well, because, if, because the, the two would, would violate the, the two would have to go above the one. So if there was a two here, the one would go over here. 
Uh, so let's say there was a 2 here, a 1 here, and a 3 here. A 1, a 2, and a 3. Um, let's say there was a 2 here and a 3 there. But then 3 would be above. Yeah, so OK, you can't, I can't, OK, good. Um, so like I said, either you say to yourself, well, what if there was something like this, and then you convince yourself that that's not possible. OK, yeah. But like what we were just saying about the, there shouldn't be a 2 on the right, that's like because in your insert encode, you always make sure that it's just, like you have to make sure that it's preserved, this like structure sort of thing. Yeah, it's because of the way you insert. It's a rule for inserting it, basically, that, that prevents that from happening. Uh, uh, okay, let me see if I try to understand what you're saying. Say that one more time. So you go 8, 4, 6, 7. Uh-huh, 8, 4, 6, 7. But how is that, there's like a different process than going 8, 4, 1, 2, and 2 would be like a, like that doesn't violate a rule that Yeah, so like let's say I added a 2 in the mix, right? Yeah. At this stage I added a 2. That would, the 2 would still end up here. Right. So, so it doesn't have to be above the 1. It does not have to be above the 1, no. Left until you can't go left anymore. OK. OK, so I know how to fix the, the idea is the following. Um, you go until, now look at, the, look at that one node while I'm saying this, OK? You go left as far as you can, then you go even to the left of 1. And if that's null, then you ease up, relax up. If you look at step number 2, print that node, and then you go to the right child. And then you pull all the way to the left, and you go all the way to 1 after that left last node. Ease up. Print that node, go to the right. OK, so pull all the way to the left. So I need to modify this to be pull all the way to the left past and then let me emphasize this, past. One past the last node, OK? So there's a phantom state to the left of the one. That's how this works. OK. Relax up. Print that node. Go to the right child. If there is no right child, then you go to, go to the right child and then go to 1. Uh, pull all the way to the left. There is nothing. You exit out of that. Then this guy here relaxes up, prints that node, goes to the right, goes all the way to the left, left there. Relaxes up, prints that. There's nothing to relax up to. Then this guy relaxes up, goes to the right, and then process continues. OK, so that's, that was the, the key difference there. OK, so um, the idea, OK, this is a, another good example. The idea is correct. The precise details matter tremendously when you're writing and designing the algorithm. Once you understand the idea, and someone else has written up the details for you, and it works beautifully, and it works what you need it to work, then you forget about those details and you use it. Okay? So just to, em just to emphasize, there's a time and a place to just understand the idea, and then there's a time and a place to really understand every single detail involved, and then there's a time and a place to forget all that and go back to the big picture. Okay? So right now, we're kind of doing both. We started with the idea. Now we need to delve deeper to understand the nuts and bolts. And then eventually, we're going to pull back out and then just start using it. Okay? When you use a set, utilizing the set container is like understanding the idea here and not having to worry about how it's actually implemented. Okay? So yes, thank you for this discussion. This was very productive, very fruitful. Okay. So let's see how, you, now it's, it's going to get even worse. Let's, let's implement a print function, okay? In other words, let's traverse 
all of the nodes in the set container. Okay? So another way to phrase it is the following. Start at the 8, print the left subtree. Again, forget about the details. Think big picture. If I want to print out all the elements in the tree in order, start with the root node, look to the left subtree, starting with the 4. That is a binary search tree, right? Satisfies the binary search tree property. Assume I can print out a smaller binary search tree. Print that out. Then I print out the root node data. And then I print out the right subtree, which is a smaller set of elements, which I assume I can, I can solve. That's the recursion, OK? So to print out all the elements in this larger binary search tree, you take the root node, you assume you can print out the left subtree, you assume you can print out the right subtree, and then your problem would be solved. So let's write a print function that recursively prints out the tree. Here's how it would look like. So let me just go back. So tree node, recall, has a data and a left and right pointers. And it's a friend of the binary search tree class. So any function we write in the binary search tree class, any member function, can access those node variables as much as it wants. So binary search tree has a print function, say. And all it's going to do, it's going to check if the root is not null. If the root is not null, then it's going to call print nodes using the root tree node object. Okay? So let's just see, now let's see what that does. So again, as far as the binary search tree is concerned, all it's telling the root node to do, it's saying root node, print your left, right, left subtree yourself and then your right subtree. And then we're going to use recursion. So here's what the tree node print nodes function would look like. So let's just imagine the 8 or the root node is calling this function. What we do is we check if our left child is not null, then what we're going to do is what? We're going to print out the subtree of the left node. Recursively call the function. Recursively in a sense. We're calling the same named function, but we're calling it using a different node as the center point. Okay. Now, let's assume we've printed out all of the elements in the left subtree correctly. Then what do we do? We print out the data ourselves. We print out the object data that called the print nodes function. So if it's the 8, we assume we've printed out all of the nodes on the left. Then what do we do? We print out the 8, print out ourselves, and then we check if our right um, child has a, or exists, and if it does, then we print out its right subtree. Okay? Does that kind of make sense? Yeah, question. Is the if statement part of the if statement? No. So the if statement, because there's no curly brackets, it only applies to the next line, which I've indented to emphasize that it's part of the if statement. And then the C out data is on its own line. So really I should let me let me show you how to how, how to effectively comment this. I, I didn't always comment uh, judiciously when I was doing this. So let me put that in as a as a reminder. And we make this, uh, that's a good enough green. OK, so here we have a control structure. So we would write something like, you know, print left sub tree. Then we print uh, nodes data. I actually dislike that shade of green. Not to be nitpicky or anything. OK. That looks better, right? That looks more like the green that we're used to. Did 
Did it change it? Yeah. No. It looks the same to me. Is that the same green than this? No. Why is it not? Now it did it, right? But it didn't change this one. There we go. OK. Print nodes data. And then I'm going to have to, uh, is it this button? Yeah, more options. And then shrink text on overflow. OK, there we go. Print nodes data. And then print write sub tree. Uh-oh. Oh, forget that. Tree. OK, so that's that. Okay, and I should really make these ones blue. Because these are keywords, the null PTRs. OK. So that's how you would more effectively comment. You would say, OK, well, there's three steps to this. Print left subtree, print nodes data, and then print right subtree. OK? And that, that's basically it. I mean, the idea with the comments, again, is I, I try to go with the paradigm one idea, one line of code. You can't always do that. I mean, you could put this all on the same line, actually. But it would make it slightly less readable. But this is the key with comments versus the code. Even if you don't understand how recursion works or what the, if you can't conceptualize or wrap your head around it, you at least have demonstrated that what you're doing, the idea is print left subtree. OK, I don't know how you would do that, but I see, yes, if you could do that, sure. Print the data, and then print right subtree. That seems reasonable to me, even though I have no idea how that works or why, why it works. That's all you need at this point. Okay, okay so there's, there's my, my non-commented uh, functions. So, oh, here we go. So uh, I walk you through it through this set of images. So again, print left subtree. So we go to the four, and then the four calls, it has a left that's not null, so it prints out, it goes to the one. Its left is null. So when we get to the one, we're inside the tree node function called by the one. It has a left child, which is null. So then it goes straight to printing out its own data. So I put that by dark blue. And now it checks to see if its right um, child is not null. But it is null, so it exits out of the function. But now we're back at the four. The four had called print nodes originally. And we got to the one by going into this statement here. So now we're out of this. Now we're going to print out the four and go to its right subtree. So we then print out the four. Now we call the function right. We go to the six. Now the six starts the function all over again. It checks its left child. It exists. So then it calls print nodes on the five. The five now calls print nodes. And it has no left. Uh, uh, pointer. The left pointer is null, so it prints out its own data. It checks to see if it has a right child, which it doesn't. So then it exits out of its function. And the 6 goes back into the 6. The 6 had just called left. Now it exits out, and it calls the, prints out the 6. Then it goes to the right, et cetera, et cetera. Okay? So, and it continues this process. So I just wanted to walk through a few of the steps to just show you that if you're in the debugger, for example, you can follow this step by step with a little arrow that goes through. So maybe if I had done a slightly better job, I would have put some more um, kind of visual aids here to show which part of the code was being accessed at which time. But you can always go back to the video as well. OK. Now we switch. Not completely from the topic of binary search trees or binary trees in general, but we take this idea of, hey, this tree structure is kind of nice. No cycles means that kind of a, it's a very ordered way of, of doing things that prevents complications. So the only thing that might be really troubling you is, well, if I do insert a list in order, I'm really not I'm going to get basically a linked list. I'm not going to get any of these really nice properties. So is there another way to work with tree structures in a way that maybe solves this issue? And here's one solution. And this has other effects as well. But let's take a look at what this proposal does. Okay? So a heap is a 
binary tree, not a binary search tree, but a binary tree with two properties. Remember, binary search tree satisfied the left to right, lower, greater property. A heap is going to be a binary tree satisfying these two properties. So, one, a heap is almost complete. What does that mean? All nodes are filled in except the last level may have some nodes missing toward the right. In other words, okay, that's, that's solving one of the big issues, right? Which is, depending on how you insert nodes in a binary search tree, your tree structure may be really unbalanced. A heap is forced to be balanced at each stage. Everything, it's going to be, look just like a pyramid shape, or like a one-dimensional pyramid, a triangle. Except maybe the last row won't be completely filled in. But everything else must be completely have a node in it. Okay, completely filled in and have a node. Two, now this is where, okay. The heap property is all nodes store values that are at least as large as the value stored in their descendants. So the root node is what node, has what value? The largest value. Everything, you pick a node and you look at all of its descendants or all of its children and its children's children and all of those, rather than satisfying a left to right ordering, this has a top to bottom. Okay, That's the essential difference, but it makes a world of difference when it comes to how you can insert elements and how you can erase elements in a heap. So here's an example of a heap, okay? Again, there is no left to right ordering here. There's a seven here, a 16 here, and then it goes back down again, okay? Which is necessary because it has to satisfy top down, okay? The 80, the root node is the largest value in the heap. That's always at the top. Excuse me. So here's some differences between binary search tree in a heap. A heap is always balanced. In other words, you, you actually don't, excuse me, you don't have to worry about having an unbalanced tree shape. Oh, excuse me. So that's a really nice property to have in general, okay? In other words, it doesn't matter how you insert the elements or in what order, doesn't matter, it will always be balanced. Second, the root element is always the largest. That's what's called a max heap. You can reverse this and say it's the smallest element and make sure the ordering is you know, lowest to largest. Same thing. It's just like with the binary search tree. You could reverse the order if you wanted to. Same thing. Okay? We fix left to right for binary search tree to make it simple, and we fix top down or max heap to make it simple. Okay, so now here's an interesting question, which is, with the binary search tree, when you insert an element, an element always goes as far down the tree as possible and ends up becoming a new uh, sort of um, extension of a current branch. But if you want to insert like a 40 here, um, it's not necessarily going to go to the end of a branch because, for example, it can't, go below the 16, it can't even go below the 25, right? It has to be above the 25. And, well, it could go below the 43, but it can't go below the 29, okay? So there are restrictions in place. So let, let's think about it. Um, so in general, there are many different places you could put the 40 in principle. But we needed to also satisfy the uh, complete, almost complete property, okay? So here's what we do. The first step is, rather than just start at the top like a binary search tree and weave our way down, we have to make sure it's completed every step. So let's take the next possible location that you could add in a node. Okay? So think about that. So we just, we're going to insert an element. The tree has to be almost complete. So first thing we do is first add in an empty node. Then we demote the parents of that node until the value of the parent is larger than the value we intend to put in there. So for example, uh, between the 10 and the 40, which one would be the parent, which one would be the child? Uh, 
the 40 would have to be the parent. So we demote the 10 to the bottom row. Now we look at the 25 versus the 40. The 40 has to be the parent of the 25. So we demote the 25. And then finally, we look at the 40 versus the 80, and the 40 would have to be the child of the 80, and the 40's found its home. Okay. Okay. Make sense? Now, how would we erase a node? Um, Okay, we're not going to show how to erase some random node. We're going to only show how to erase. So let's forget about the 40 for a second. Let's go back to our original picture, original tree. We're not going to erase a random node. Typically, if you're storing your elements in a heap, you want to prioritize like a set of tasks. And you're going to do that highest priority task first, like the 80 is the highest priority task. When it's done, you're going to remove just the root reshuffle everyone around, and then go on to the next highest priority task. And then when that's done, remove that, et cetera, et cetera. So while you can remove a random root inside of a heap, the procedure is a little bit more complicated. All we need to think about is how to remove the root node. So let's think about it. So how do we do this? Well, we're going to get rid of the 80. We need to make sure that we still maintain the top-down structure. And in particular, it needs to be complete. So we cannot just uh, leave a tree, the tree in, a, in, a, in an unbalanced state. It has to be pretty much complete. So just like when we inserted, we, we inserted a new uh, node right where it should have been, let's do the same thing with the 4. The 4, that node, this locate, not the 4 itself, but the location of the 4 was the last thing to be inserted. So let's get rid of that and put the 4 where the 80 is. Okay, So we're getting rid of the 80, and we need to maintain the balanced nature of the tree. So the last location added was where the 4 currently is. So let's get rid of that location and just make the value of 80 turn that into a 4 because we popped out the 80. We've gotten rid of the 80. And now what do you suppose we should do? demote until we satisfy the heat property. So look, between the 25 and the 57, can I replace, can I demote the 4 to where the 25 is? Can I swap the 25 and the 24? So as far as the 4 is concerned, that'd be fine, but the 57 says, no, the 25 cannot be above me, that would violate me. So between the 25 and the 57, you should, you should swap with the 57. Okay? Because that way, in other words, you look at the left and the right child and you replace it with the... Lar yeah, yeah, very good. Yeah, the larger of those two children. Okay, and that's the 57. So you swap that out. Okay? Now between the 43 and the 29, which one is larger? The four, right? So when I explain it as you just pick the larger child, then it's quite, quite natural. You replace the 43 with the 4, or you swap those out. And again, because you've replaced it with the larger one, and all descendants are smaller than that node, you still maintain the heap property after each demotion. Okay? Now the 4 is in its rightful place, and we're done. Here's why tree structures are very advantageous um, in general. The reason why trees are so nice is because you sort of double the number of nodes that you can store, but you only add one more decision left or right for each node in the tree. Okay? So if you've gotten down to this last level, if I have another level, I basically doubled the number of nodes in the tree, but I've only added one yes or no decision to each node. Okay, so let's just take a look at the slide again. So a tree has levels, 
And a binary tree of level H with n nodes satisfies something along those lines. If it's balanced, it satisfies that, that framework there. Okay? So in a heap, for example, the level H is uh, basically the log base 2, somewhere around the log base 2, of the number of nodes in the heap. Okay? So if we needed to access or remove or insert or anything, if we needed to do anything, um, the added structure means that we only really need to look at a path of length log base 2 of n. Okay? That's why these tree structures are very advantageous. They basically convert operations that would have taken on the order of n and converted them into operations on the order of log of n. And log is an extremely slowly growing function. Well, it's actually called a slowly a, well, it's called slowly varying, but slow growth function. Okay. It's as, almost as good as a constant because there's something like 10 to the 81st atoms in the universe. You know what log of 10 to the 81st is? Like 300 something. Okay, so it's a no brainer. You know, there, log, logarithmic growth is about as, as puny as you get in practice. You can get log log growth, but that's just nonsense. It's not nonsense, but it's, 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 uh, it's not really perceptible. Does that make sense? OK. And you know what? I'm just going to go to the next slide. Keep maps and pairs. A map. A map is like a function. Okay. So I, I introduced this notation back in the beginning of the quarter so that the homework assignments were easier for me to write unambiguously. This is one of the great things about mathematical notation is it is designed to be understood universally no matter you know, who's reading it. and It's designed to be completely unambiguous. Okay? So a map is like a function. And a lot of times, like, like we see, we don't really care about the particular formula like x squared. What we care about is the characteristic of that function, which is, okay, it's going to accept a real number and return another real number. Just like when you define a function in C++, as far as the compiler is initially concerned, in your header part of your main, you really just need to tell the compiler the name of the function and the data types of the input parameters and the data type of the return parameter. Okay? So in mathematics, it's, it's the exact same thing. A lot of times we just don't care about the formula itself. We just know that uh, pr functions with certain properties behave in certain ways. So here, for example, uh, operator plus, the non-member operator plus would map, for example, two polynomial objects and return another polynomial object. Here, I've kind of suppressed the const and const reference and those, those things. Okay? So just in general, it takes an object of that type and returns another object of that type. Um, similarly, you have a function which accepts a string and returns a string, accepts a double, returns an int, et cetera, et cetera. Okay? And again, you can get more detailed with, does it return a string? or a string reference, or a const string reference, or a const string. OK, so you can get more detailed if you like. But now, here's a good question. Let's say you have a map, right? Which is, there's some function I'm thinking of, and it takes a string and returns a double. OK? Usually we have a formula like, in math, we go like f of x equals x cubed. Or you know, f of x equals uh, the derivative of blah, blah, blah. Okay? Something like that. But for, you know, the reason the formulas are nice is because the formulas tell us the behavior for an entire large amount of input values. Okay? So for example, you know, what is my function f of x doing? f of x equals x cubed, it's telling me, you give me any x, say, in the re as a real number, and I will give you this answer that you're requesting. But a lot of times, you don't need an answer to every single type of input. 
where most input values are just going to be zero. And in other words, how do you specify a formula which maps a string to a double? Sometimes you, it's an idea which is, well, you take the number of f's, you multiply that by 2.7, and then you, you know, you could write a recipe for it. You know, that's the set of instructions in code. But there's nothing, it doesn't, you don't need to have it specified for all possible values. Maybe the string Bob returns a 3.8, and then the string Catherine returns a 3.9966, where it's some measure of, say, GPA. There's no formula based on those letters that tells you what, how to get the value out of it. So let's pull back the abstraction. Rather than thinking of a function or a map as a formula, which you can do, let's instead just think of it as associating pairs of values. That's really what a function is. It's just a way to say this value here corresponds to this value over here. And if it's a function, then it corresponds to a single value. So let's just assume we're dealing with uh, those functions. Okay? So it's OK. Larry and Spock can both map to the same value. That's fine. Because the pair Larry1123 and the pair Spock in 1123, those are two different values. It's kind of like x squared, right? Where you know, minus 2 and plus 2 both map to the same value of 4. Okay? So here would be something like maybe student ID number. There's not any formula that you can use to generate all possible values, but you still want to be able to list just the pairs themselves that correspond to the values. So here's how you would actually do this in code. So there's actually a data type called map. It's not like a function, like it's a formula. It's literally just a collection of key value pairs. Okay? The key is, for example, the string, like Bob, Larry, Hamlet. And the value is the, the value it maps to. Okay? But it really is just generalizing this notion of a function Rather than thinking of it as a formula, just thinking of it as a collection of pairs of values. And so here, for example, you know, I set up all of these equalities. And then at the end here, I can access a value based on what's called the key. So id of, and then we give it a key, and it returns the value. Now, what, what is this? Why does, what, what is this notation? Uh, square brackets telling you about the data type of ID. Let me say it again. Sorry? It's a container that has what, what functionality defined? The square bracket operator defined. Okay? That's all this is. Is somebody defined a, a class that overloads this square bracket operator to accept the data type of type string and return the, well, the data type of the first argument and then returns a value of the type of the second argument. Okay? So it's literally just overlo operator overloading. That's why this notation works. But how intuitive, is this notation intuitive? Does this make sense on, when you just glance at it? Yeah, that's the idea. It's like a function, but it's really just indexing a collection, a finite collection of values, which can, you can think of it like a vector in a sense, but it's not. It's actually stored as a binary search tree. And every time you call ID of Spock, it's doing a search for Spock. <laughs> get, get, yeah, okay, you don't get it. That's fine, that's fine. Um, you should watch that movie anyway, actually Wrath of Khan, before you watch the, the Into Darkness movie. You'll enjoy it on a much deeper level than otherwise. Okay, so every time you try and call or get access to Spock, it searches for that element and then it returns the value. Okay, so it's not like a vector in that it just knows exactly where to go. It actually takes this binary search tree structure, searches for the value, and then returns the value at that node. Okay. Um, so, okay, let me just wrap up with this. Now nah, let's not wrap up with this, okay? So I'll leave you with that idea, is a map just stores a collection of key value pairs, and then to access a particular mapping, you search by the key, and then it does a find 
in, much, in exactly the same way as the binary search tree algorithm searches for an element. Okay, I'll see you on Monday.